a lot of the majority, it's been an eye-opener. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father in heaven, we welcome you here. Um, People are joining us from all across the globe because they've been awakened to truth. And Father, I want to use your Bible and your Bible alone because your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And I really believe that the journey is about to end. I don't know when. I don't necessarily know all the hows. But I believe the journey is about to end. And I have a passion in my heart and a fire in my bones for my family, for my friends, for my neighbors to know what the Bible says about the time of the end. So I pray today as we tackle this difficult subject of judgment that all of us will leave here today recognizing that this is just another act of love from God. In your name I pray, amen. Well, it is serious. Um, It is serious when we talk about judgment. And I've entitled the sermon for today, Accused but Exonerated. You're going to discover, you know, week by week as we keep meeting like this, that you're going to express all spectrum of your emotions. Sometimes your mouth will drop. I've had people email me. I says, really? I, I looked it up. I Googled it. You're right. I can't believe this. Other times you may be moved to tears. But today, it's, it's a very serious biblical subject. So hold on to your emotions. It's, it's very important to the Bible, this concept of judgment, because it's referred to in the Bible over a thousand times, and most commonly in the book of Revelation. If I was to ask you a question this morning, how many of you uh, have ever been to court? Yeah, I, I, probably half of you. Uh, you know, have been to court uh, for whatever reason. Uh, I don't feel guilty. Just raise it. You know, sometimes it's not your fault, but you had to go. But I ask you another question: How many of you, when you went to court, took with you an attorney? Yeah, a lot, a lot less hands, uh, a lot less hands. I, I assume. Um, Leo Shriven, who is the one responsible for these talks that I'm sharing with you. Uh, shared of a time when uh, he first went to court at the age of 17. He was driving a little rabbit Volkswagen diesel through Wyoming, and after gassing up a little station in the middle of nowhere, he realized that he'd been given some, some bad fuel as his engine was sputtering and backfiring and spitting out all kinds of weird stuff. And so he found out that the only way he could keep his car going, his car going was to go at 150 kilometers an hour. Well, of course, you guessed it. A police car pulls up behind him and asked him why he was going so fast. And so he tells me, he says, look, my, can you hear my car? It's rattling. There's stuff that's being spit out the, the pipe there. He says, I got some bad gas down, bad fuel down the road. <laughs> and... Uh, and, and I have to keep it at 150 kilometers an hour or else uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen. This, this thing's going to explode. Uh, he was really nice and he says, well, you know, I have to write you up because I got you locked up in my radar gun. But why don't you go to court and I'll come there and I'll stand by you and we're going to be able to beat this ticket. And so three months later, he goes to Rawlings, Wyoming to sit in court to fight this ticket and he walked into this what he called a little one horse town into this tiny courtroom and there was a lady that greeted him at the entrance and she basically told him where to go and he walks into this room where there's a a little tiny throne in the middle and a couple of chairs and sure enough after a few minutes of sitting down there the police officer shows up they shake hands and Leo was pretty sure that he had this in the bag After a few minutes, the same lady that met him at the door walked through the front with a black robe. 
and he realized that she was the judge. He pleaded guilty, and she asked him if he wanted to address the court, and he said, sure. And so he told her his story, and then he said that the officer would back him up, and sure enough, he came up and gave an eloquent speech on his behalf, and Leo thought he had this thing licked. But she didn't see it the same way at all. As a matter of fact, maybe she was having a bad day, uh, but she basically says, I am sick of teenagers driving across my state, disrespecting the speed limits, drinking as they're driving. You're all the same. I am going to teach you a lesson. She went on and on and on about how horrible teenagers are, how bad drivers they are, and so she basically took away all the points he had on his driver's license, impounded his car, and she slammed a hammer on the desk and walked out of the room. And Leo looked at the police officer, and the police officer looked at him, and he said something that Leo has never forgotten. The police officer looked at him and said, next time you go to court... Make sure you bring with you an attorney. My friends, I believe this morning that every single one of us is going to court. And I would recommend that you bring with you the best attorney, Jesus Christ. He's never lost a case and he's pro bono. In the book of Acts, chapter 17, Paul is in a city called Athens. And he walks around and he sees a statue amongst many other statues of gods. And he sees this one statue that says, to the unknown God. And he begins to talk with the philosophers of Athens. And in the middle of his speech, he says this, truly, These times of ignorance God overlooked. Talking about from that point to the past. But now God commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day. Not a time, not a season, not a section of human history. A day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. That would be Jesus Christ. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. This verse is very clear that there will be a judgment day. And next week we're going to talk more about that appointed day. We're going to reveal to you the longest prophecy. The title of the sermon for next week is entitled The Final Cleansing. This is going to, I I always say it, I know, blow your mind, but it will. This is the most amazing prophecy that I've ever read in the Bible. So let's go to the book of Revelation and see what it has to say about this judgment. If you go to Revelation chapter 14. So by now you're probably pretty comfortable as to where the book of Revelation is. It's all the way at the end of your Bible. And uh, we'll go to chapter 14 and we'll read uh, verses 6 and 7. I have verse 7 on the screen. But we'll read verse 6 as well. And... um, uh, this is, uh, you know, some of you who may have been around Seventh-day Adventist or what have you we call about. We, t- we talk about the three angels messages on our logo and all these different things. Um, these, this is the first of the three angels message. And it says in uh, verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, to every tribe, to every tongue, and to every people. So whatever this message is, it is meant for everyone. Everyone across the globe. And then 
This is, this is how critical this message is. And saying with a loud voice, he says, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. Jesus says judgment will happen. And here in Revelation 14 verse 7, it has come. As we face this judgment hour, the court is summoned for each and every one of us. If you go to the book of 2 Corinthians, so go back from Revelation, pretty much in the middle of the New Testament, the book of 2 Corinthians, this is Paul who wrote a book to the church in Corinth. And uh, when he writes these messages to these churches, these are messages to us too. And here he's very specific. He says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he or she has done, whether good or bad. Folks, this is something that you cannot avoid. None of us can avoid this judgment. If you're a people, if you're a tongue, if you're a nation, and if you're a tribe, your case will appear before God. And the Bible describes to us uh, some of these scenes. If you want to go to the book of Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 7, uh, it really gives us a, a, a neat description of what this, th this, this judgment scene looks like. Daniel chapter 7, you go to verses 9 and 10. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. It says, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. The Ancient of Days is as a, another name for, you got it, for God. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. This is a pretty magnificent courtroom. I would be intimidated to walk in a place like this. God sitting on his throne, surrounded by millions and billions of angels, and they open up the books. And, true to what we've always said from the beginning of the series, whatever Daniel says is often matched by the book of Revelation. Go to Revelation chapter 20. We have another description of this scene as well. Revelation chapter 20. This is near the end of the book of Revelation. And you go to verse 12. And it says, we can start at verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according by their works, by the things which were written in the books. This raises up a lot of questions for me. One, if God knows everything, why does he need to judge? That's a fair question, don't you think? And number two, if you're judged as to whether you've been good or bad or according to your works, which means what you've done, how does that fit with what we talked about last week? We talked about justification and sanctification, that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and not of our works. Well, I'd like to balance this out for you today. There's only one way to be saved. Only one way to be saved, and that's by the love and righteousness of Jesus Christ. And then there's only one way to be lost by your attempt to be righteous on your own. 
In other words, if you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, his perfect works cover you. We talked about this last week. If you don't accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, your efforts will not be good enough. You know why they won't be good enough? It's not because you haven't tried. The Lord knows we all try. But because only perfection and sinlessness prevent death. Only perfection. And neither you or I are or can be perfect on our own. For that, we need the perfect love and righteousness of Jesus Christ. While we live here on earth, by the grace of God as a gift that he has given to each and every one of us, being saved by grace is one thing. Being judged by our works is something else. See, there are two phases to this judgment. The judgment of the righteous and the judgment of the wicked. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a future sermon. But I want you to put that in the back of your mind. And they are not judged by the same books. You see, the works that we do, the good deeds, the things that we do, the way we react, how we help the helpless and the orphans and the widows and all these different things, they simply give evidence of our salvation through faith. They are not a key to salvation. They are a response to salvation. Good works allows you, this is so important, good works allows you to thrive in your salvation and it allows you to bring others to that same salvation. That's the purpose for good works. You begin to watch and pray like we talked about last week. Watch what you put in your mind and you replace it with the word of God. And the more you put God's word in, the more his spirit comes in you. And then it's not your works, it's Christ working in you. And it's hard for us to admit that as a world today. We want people to see that we are good. But what we should really be trying to do is to show the world that Jesus is good. Not us. It's like a politician, especially during an election year. They go knocking on your door. They make promises. They ask you what you would like to see being done different. But when they're elected, those promises can sometimes be left on the wayside. Therefore, their works gives evidence to whether or not they really meant what they said. Many Christians have the same issue. It's not that they're bad people. It's just that they aren't watching and praying. And therefore, they continue to worry, to judge, to hurt others, and to hurt themselves. So keep that simple balance. You can't be saved by your works, but you can be judged by them. I think that bad works put into question the validity of your salvation, especially bad works for which you find excuses for or bad works for which you blame other people. Oh, I do it because she did this to me or because he said that to me. All right, we need to move on. Here on earth, every judgment case takes three very simple steps. Investigation of the evidence, decision or verdict, and a punishment or a reward. And heaven's judgment is no different. So let's take these three step by step as we try to understand. By the time we're done, folks, you are not going to see God the same way. You are, you are not going to be afraid of the judgment anymore. If you are, I am no longer afraid of it. So investigating the evidence. We already know that has to take place prior to Jesus' coming. Investigation always happens before the judgment is given. 
And so he can't come until everyone has been investigated. But we do have a time frame in the Bible as to when uh, that might happen. If you go to Revelation, you're already there. Just go to chapter 11 and verse 18. It gives us a very interesting, interesting timeline as to when this judgment would happen. It says in Revelation 11, verse 18, it says, The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you show reward. You should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. You see, there's two, two things here to help us to, to put, a, to put a, a clock on this judgment. One is that the nations are angry. I mean, that's today. <laughs> the nations are angry. And it talks about that he'll destroy those who destroy the earth. Wow. We are destroying the earth. And when I'm talking about the earth, it's not just talking about pollution. It's talking about destroying people. Destroying what God has created. At the time when men has the potential to damage this earth, that's when God says the dead are going to be judged. So how will he investigate the evidence? Well, as we read earlier, um, it says that the books, the judgment is set and the books are open. For the first part of this judgment, there's only one book that's needed. The Bible calls it the book of life. In Revelation 20, verse 15, it says, And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Chapter 21, 27. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. You see, it's called the Lamb's Book of Life. And allow me to just be creative here. Because in this book, people's names are written in red. People who accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for their lives, he writes their names in red, symbolizing his blood was poured for them. That's what the Book of Life is all that's written in it are names. You want to be in that book. In Revelation 3 verse 5, I find this very interesting. It says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. You know what this makes me think of? It makes me think that at the beginning, everybody's name is in the book of life. You see, it's not about having your name written in it. It's about having your name not blotted out of it. You see, Christ wants to give everybody. He wants to save everybody. He wants no one to perish, but all to live with him in everlasting life. That's why he says, I will not blot out his name. Every time he has to erase a name, it creates tears in Jesus' eyes. He will confess your name. And say, Henry, no, no, no. Henry is mine. He is mine. I died for him. Father, save him because I died for him. Man, isn't that beautiful? This is an incredible promise. He will confess your name before the Father and all of the angels. Just like the police officer did for Leo. He showed up and he says, this is the situation. The difference is that this judge, God, he will listen. He will listen to his son, Jesus. I want to make one thing absolutely sure today like we spoke last week, if you've repented of your wayward life, if you've confessed your sins both to God and to man, and you've accepted to let Jesus change your heart and lead you instead of the world, your name is in the book of life. 
thank God for Jesus Christ. This whole judgment is in your favor. Jesus is going to stand up for you. You have an attorney in heaven that will never lose a case and God wants you to have that assurance and that joy. Judgment is not a thing to fear. I don't know if you're starting to see the pattern of these texts that we're reading, but every text about judgment is always in your favor. And we'll discuss a little bit more in a minute. I like Psalms 50, verse 4 to 6. Psalm 50, verse 4 to 6. It says, with the book of life, God on his throne begins his work of judgment with Jesus as your advocate, surrounded by millions and millions of angels. And it says in Psalms 54 to 6, he shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Let the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Who is being judged in this first part of the judgment? The saints. The saints is another word. It's a biblical meaning for those who have accepted the blood of the Lamb in their stead. They have recognized that they can't do it on their own. They need salvation from Jesus and they've accepted that. They are considered saints. And look, if you want, go, go to Peter. Just not far from the book of Revelation. Uh, if you go to 1 Peter 4 verse 17. Because I just mentioned to you that he's going to begin the judgment with the saints. And 1 Peter 4 verse 17 says that. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey and accept the gospel of God. Never once has God mentioned the wicked, the sinners and those that are lost. Every single verse we read so far, the judgment is for God's people, those in the book of life. And here it says again, he judges his people to gather his saints. Why? Why would he begin with them? This is one of the most fascinating things in the Bible. How many of you this morning, there's only five of us here, but you're watching, but out of the five of you that are here, how many of you have sinned? Raise your hand. Okay. So there's five of us in this room who have sinned. Do you realize that when you sin, you lay legal claim, Satan lays legal claim to your life? legal claim to your life. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the penalty for death. The penalty for sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. I didn't make it up. God made it up. God is the one who decided that the penalty for sin is death. Therefore, every single one of us today, including yours truly, deserve death. Because we've all sinned, we have a sinful nature from birth, and Satan does not let go easy. Once he has you, he will sink his teeth into you, and he will not let you go. So here's what happens. If the devil legally owns you, then you need to find a way to get out of this dilemma. Did you know that the devil has such a legal claim on you that he literally goes into God's face and boasts about the fact that he owns you? The devil hates you so much that he flaunts you in God's face as God's failure and as his success. Go to Job. If you have your Bible... Go to Job. Job is just before the book of Psalms. It's in the Old Testament. It's written the same way as Job, but we pronounce it Job. If you go to the book of Job, right at the beginning of the book, um, it's Job chapter 1. I'd like to read something to you that's very interesting. And um, 
boy, I, that book is, is such, a, such an amazing book. As a matter of fact, for those of you who are uh, part of our small groups, and by the way, we have somebody, I just wanted to let you know, we have somebody from Ohio, two people from Ohio who are joining us in our small group on Wednesday nights. And so we have small groups, we, ve- we meet via Zoom, and, and you can meet with us, we discuss some of these things, because some of you have questions or, or, or comments about these things. Please send me an email, franduville at gmail.com or francis.d at reallyliving.ca. Send me an email and say, I want to be part of one of your small groups. You can join. We have them on Tuesday nights, Wednesday nights, Thursday nights. And uh, it gives you a chance to kind of wrestle with some of these things. And you're going to wrestle with Job uh, this week. Uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to, 1 to 12. But we're not going to read all of that right now. Uh, But you go to verse 6. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, Where are you coming from? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. That's Satan's way of saying, That place belongs to me. And everybody who's there belongs to me because they gave it to me. They believed my lie and now they belong to me. You have no right over them. I, we know that God kicked Satan out of heaven and we talked about it, but somehow the devil still has access when God allows it because of God's mercy and allows the devil to state his part of the case. But Satan basically builds an argument that Job is only following God. You'll read it this week because he's got everything on a silver platter. Take away his foundations and he will fall like all the rest of them. You've given him too much. Of course he follows you. You've blessed him beyond belief. Ten children, Seven sons, three daughters, millions of dollars in property, donkeys and camels and all these different things. Take it all away. He'll curse you to your face. And so God says, go ahead. Take everything away except for his life. And for the next 41 chapters is a story of a man who is being attacked by Satan. And at the end... His only words were truly God gives and God takes away. But though he slay me, I will follow. Satan is on your case. Zechariah chapter 3 verse 1. I think I have that one on the screen. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. You go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. It says, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, that's Satan, who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Day and night, Satan goes to God and says, did you see Francis? He preaches. He goes up front and preaches these things. And he doesn't even practice what he preaches. You're a failure, God. These people don't love you. Give up. Walk away. By the way, they deserve to die, God, because that's your rule. You said the wages of sin is death. So they all deserve to die and they're all mine. What are you going to do about it, God? Because of Satan's constant accusations, God says there is only one way that I can get them out of this mess. Satan is right. This child is a sinner. He fell to your deceptions and he or she deserves to die. I have got to legally represent them. Folks, I hope you're starting to see where this is going. This whole judgment thing. This is what the judgment is all 
about. Judgment is not because God needs to know who screwed up and who didn't or how bad you screwed up or how little you screwed up. No. Judgment is God's loving solution to shut up Satan and save you and me. And because the death penalty is given for sin, God gave his only begotten son to die for you and me. And when Satan shows up and says, he's mine, Jesus says, "Uh uh-uh. I died for her. I died for him. They gave me their life. Satan, get out of here. You You don't have a leg to stand on. Remember that promise in Genesis chapter 3? There's a struggle behind the scenes, folks. A heavenly struggle, if you will, for your heart. And Jesus met the devil on his turf and crushed his head. And every time someone like you accepts Jesus Christ as their personal savior, Satan loses his grip on one more. One more. One at a time. Don't fear the judgment. It was established to save you and me. God had to legally represent you by giving his son to die because death is a penalty for sin so that you don't have to die. Now don't tell me that's not a loving God and that this whole judgment scene is not set up for you to succeed. You can't lose if you're on God's side. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Wow. We're going to talk about the sanctuary system next week. You're going to, I'm just going to say it again. You're going to be blown away. That's my favorite sermon out of all of them. I can't wait to share it with you. Let's go to the second part, the decision and the verdict. If you go to Revelation chapter 22, this is the last chapter in the Bible. Revelation chapter 22. Uh, Something very interesting. This is something that Jesus says just before he comes. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 11 and 12. It says, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. Who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his works. Every case has been decided. And Jesus says, These words just before he comes. Four adjectives to describe two different classes of people. And this really ties in with what we talked about last week. On the one side, he talks about those who are unjust and filthy. And on the other side, he talks about those who are righteous and holy. Saved and unsaved. Why is this? Don't miss this. Last week, we studied that when you come to Jesus as you are, you confess your sins, he loves you unconditionally, he accepts you with open arms, and you are justified. I'm repeating this a lot, folks, because it is hard to get this into our hard heads. As soon as you're justified, then you make a promise. I want to love you and serve you. I will feed on your word and assimilate the Bible into my life. I want the Spirit of God to renew my mind, my character. And you begin to watch and pray. And the Lord begins to work in you and makes changes in you. And therefore, you begin to live a holy life. But the side that is lost, they're called unjust. Simply put, they've never been justified by Jesus Christ. They've never had a need for him even though this free gift is available to all many people will reject it and that makes them not just unjust but filthy why the bible says that the good things that we do our righteousness are like filthy rags 
If the good that we do is not credited to God, not sourced out of a relationship with God, it is filthy. You may do it for public praise, you may do it for material gain or influence, but it isn't godly good, it's selfish good. So when I hear people say, I don't need God, I don't need religion, I'm a good person, the Bible says that's filthy talk. Please don't miss the other side. They are righteous, not of themselves. We can't be righteous of ourselves, but Jesus imputing us his righteousness, you are covered as if he had, you had never sinned because he never sinned, like the thief on the cross that we talked about last week, but it doesn't stop there. They are holy, meaning that we are living a sanctified life. Their works are showing that Christ is living in their hearts and is making them into a new creation and renewing their minds. As slow as it might go, some of us sometimes are like, man, why can't I change? If justification doesn't lead you to sanctification, then you'll lose both. Let's say your heart is moved by a teenager who is unable to afford post-secondary education. I'm trying to use an example here. I hope this works. My wife is always good at telling me if my illustrations work or not. I <laughs> will see. You see the potential in this teenager and you told them, you've talked to them, they've told you they really want to go to college and university, so you tell them, get enrolled, I'll flip the bill. Throughout their school year, they go to parties, they get involved with the wrong crowd, they don't study, they barely pass some courses and fail others, and after two years or so, they end up quitting, leaving the school and blaming you for their failure. Folks, were they justified? For those of you who are here, were they justified? Yeah. Their tuition was paid. Were they sanctified? No. They didn't graduate. Now, I'm not saying summa cum laude. They didn't have to graduate top of the class. Well, they had to graduate. I am justified, and now God is working in my life to change me day by day. I may learn math, I may get to calculus and linear algebra and trigonometry, but eventually I get to graduation. What about what about the wicked people? If all the righteous have been judged to this point, then when will the wicked be judged and by whom? We haven't talked about them yet. When are they going to be judged? And this, this will fascinate you. Go to Revelation chapter 20. This chapter talks about the millennium and um, the 1,000 years of peace. And we're going to cover that in a future talk. So don't worry about that particular prophecy now. But in the context of this 1,000 years, let's see what's going to happen. Revelation chapter 20. 20, and we'll go to verse 4. I wish I could read the whole verse 1 to 6 to you, but I don't want to confuse you. There, there's a lot here. We're going to talk about this in the near future. But let's just go to verse 4. It says, and I saw thrones. This is after the thousand years. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Who's them? It's not God. It's them. And it tells us who them are. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast in his image, had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for one thousand years but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished i'll stop there i've already gone too far 
during the thousand years where the saints will live with Christ. We'll talk about that later. Don't worry. It says that the saints are going to sit on thrones and judge. Who are the saints? Those who died and were persecuted for the testimony of Jesus and those who didn't worship the beast, who didn't bow down to his image or received its mark. And I know a lot of you are asking me, you know, what is that? And we're going to get there. But we have to build. We have to take time. Too, too often people will throw stuff at you from the Bible and you get overwhelmed. But we're taking our time. I want to build this so that you have a strong foundation. You can believe on something that's real. So those martyrs and those who did not worship the beasts, they'll be the ones who will be judging the wicked. I know this sounds really surprising, but there are other verses that talk about this. If you go to 1 Corinthians 6, 2-3, it says, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters now? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? We are going to judge the world and angels. And when I say we, I believe that I am going to be with Jesus Christ one day. And I believe you will too. Which angels do you think that we're going to judge? Which ones? Yeah, the ones that were kicked out of heaven. It says that in 2 Peter. It says, for if God, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Why? Why? Why would God do it this way? Folks, I hope you're still hanging on because this is what I have considered to be the most beautiful part of this message. Why would God ask the saints to judge? This is how I believe it works. On the one hand, your God has earned a right to represent you and save you in heaven's judgment. We've already talked about that. Jesus paved a debt penalty by shedding his blood on a Roman cross, so God has, God has earned a right to save you by his grace. But on the other hand, God is so open, reasonable, honest, and logical that he says, I am not going to judge the world. I didn't come to judge it. I sent my son to save it. I'm going to let other people scrutinize my decision to decide who goes and who doesn't go. I find that absolutely beautiful. People like you who have lived on this earth, lived through temptation and trials, and saw the works of sin and of the devil, I'm going to let you judge, and you decide if I am just, if I am fair, if I am true, and if I am honest. God doesn't need us to do this. The universe already knows his character, but he does it so that you and I will have peace in our hearts in regards to his justice and love. Let's say, for example, that you get to heaven, when you get to heaven, and someone that you expected to be there is not there. You're going to have a few questions for God. What if God said, I'm the judge. They didn't let me take over their hearts. They didn't listen to me. It's my decision. Live with it. What if God answered that to you when you got up there? I don't think we would take that answer very well. We would always wonder, is God really fair? Did he really do everything he could to save that person? You know, as, as we look at this COVID-19 crisis all around us, leaders of nations are constantly being questioned. Did the 
close the borders too late? They, they, are they doing enough testing? Did they do it soon enough? Uh, you know, are they opening the businesses too soon? God says, here's the throne. Look at the books. Look at the person's record. And you tell me if I was just and if I was fair. There's no hiding with God. There's no hidden agenda with God. He's all love. And he's willing for you to scrutinize his judgment. If somebody is not there, we will clearly see that it was not God's fault. But rather, their choice of loving sin more than the Savior, loving the world more than salvation, or living in guilt rather than living in freedom. That's what will be written in the books. I mean, go again to Revelation 20, verse 12. We read it earlier. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Folks, if your name is written in the book of life, written in red, God doesn't need to look at the books. The books is the record of our wrongs. God doesn't need to look at them because you've been covered by the blood of Jesus. But if you haven't been covered by the blood of Jesus, then the books report who you truly are. Oh yeah, you can show this world a strong face. But you can't dupe God. You cannot dupe your creator. And us... We, it will give us peace in our heart that God did everything he could to save every single human being. And we will bow down on our knees and we will say, God, truly you are righteous. But it's much bigger than this. I'm not done yet. Remember the war in heaven? We talked about a couple of weeks ago. Lucifer was created as the highest angel in heaven next to the throne of God. And the Bible doesn't tell us how long he was there for. But at one point, he became prideful. And the one interesting thing about God is that he gives every being that he created free will. So Lucifer's pride got the best of him because of his beauty and he began to covet the throne of God, meaning he wants to be in that place. And when that happened, sin and rebellion broke out in heaven. And try to put yourself in God's place. When sin broke out in heaven, God had two choices. He could have killed Lucifer on the spot and all those angels. He could have done it. He's got the power to do it. Or let them live out their rebellion. What would have happened to his relationship with the other two-thirds of the angels had he wiped out the one-third? Just like that. I think they would have lived in fear of God. But God cannot accept a service of fear because he's a God of love. His entire kingdom is based on love. If you're a parent and your child does something wrong, he hurts another kid and the other kid has to go to the hospital and has to get stitches, why don't you just kill your child and make a new one? They did something wrong. You told them not to do that. I mean, you can make 10 more, 12 more. 13 more. The ladies are looking at me like, you crazy? <laughs> One's enough. I'm sorry, Lydia. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just two weeks, you just gave birth. Uh, but you, you, you understand what I'm trying to say. You're not going to kill that child because he or she made a mistake because you love them. When they blatantly oppose your advice and end up hurting others, hurting you, hurting themselves, your reputation, why don't you just wipe them out from the face of the earth and start over? 
because you love them. God is no different. You know, having children gives us a little sneak peek into the character and the love of God. By creating life, God takes a chance. And you do the same when you have children. Who tells you that that child is not going to turn around someday and hurt you or even worse, uh, go to jail or, or kill you? You don't know that. We all take a chance. And we could take a chance because we give our children free will. Nobody wants to have a robot that says, I love you, mom. I love you, mom. You want them to say it because they mean it. They feel it. They're experiencing it. Sometimes they say it in weird ways. They'll come in and they'll give you a quick kiss and go to their room and spend the next three hours there. But yet they gave you that kiss before they went to the room. Love has to be given because if there's no love, there's no relationship. And God wants a relationship. God took a chance with every angel he created and gave them free will just like parents do. And so when God created Lucifer, he gave them a free choice with no guarantee. And when Lucifer and his, and his angels went astray, it broke his heart just like it breaks your heart as a parent when your child decides to go against your counsel. So God, totally able to kill Lucifer, loved him enough to give Lucifer a chance to demonstrate his point. Now, listen to me carefully. You're not going to like what I'm about to say, but I believe it's the truth. God says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a perfect earth. From my hands of love, I'm going to put you and your angels on it. It's your planet. You can do with it whatever you want. With people. And I'm even going to put a tree in the middle of the garden called the tree of good and evil so they have a choice to follow you or follow me. Satan, I'm going to give you a few centuries to prove your point. Show me that your government of jealousy, envy, sin, and hatred is better than my government of freedom, of love, of justice, and of mercy. And at the end, we're going to let the people decide. Not you, not me. The people. And as you're sitting right now in your home today, you may not realize this, but you are the theater of the universe. This little speck of dust floating in our galaxy with 700 billion stars and billions of other suns as a speck of dust in the universe with 400 billion other galaxies. This is the only place in the universe where sin is demonstrating itself. And every day of your life is a theater to the entire universe. And it doesn't take too much intelligence to look at this present world to realize that the devil's program is hell on earth. When it's all over and we put on those judgment thrones, having lived here, having experienced it, you are going to have a testimony that no one else in the universe has. You have been saved by grace and given strength through Jesus Christ to make it to the end. I lived in this infected world. I never want to live in a place like that again. That will be your testimony that will stop sin forever infecting the universe again. God is so intelligent and knowledgeable. Maybe as a society, we should stop doubting him and start studying who he really is. You don't have to fear the judgment. The Bible says he wants no one to be lost, but all to come to repentance. Listen to this song. This is a song in Revelation chapter 15. Um, beautiful, beautiful song. Maybe, Rick, we should, make a, we should make a song to these words. Revelation chapter 15, and we can start at verse 2. Revelation chapter 15, and starting at verse 2, it says, And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, and they say these words, Great and marvelous are your works, 
Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? By the way, the word fear here is being described. It's people who glorify his name, not people who are afraid of him. But glorify your name, for you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you. For your judgments have been manifested. And every knee has bowed and given glory to God. Everyone has recognized that God's judgments are true. But not everyone's going to sing this song, right? Number three, punishment and reward. It says in Revelation 20, 15, it says, And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I want to pause here. Really important. In a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about this concept of hell. Folks, hell is what has caused so many people to leave the church. This concept that we have this retributive God who can't wait to just burn people and burn them for ages for their sins and for the wrong things that they have done. You're going to see that in hellfire, God has a plan, a beautiful plan. And by the time we're done, you will love God even more than before. And perhaps lose some of that fear that you've always had in the back of your mind. But the punishment, even though it says, you know, anyone found not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is a tool to lead to the real punishment. The real punishment is to be separated from God forever the fire is just a tool to destroy it will only last minutes the reward all right close your eyes close your eyes and try to imagine a place where there's no pain try to imagine a place where the lion is going to sit by the lamb Try to imagine a place where there is no income tax. A place where there's no hospitals. Nobody ever gets hurt, both physically and emotionally and socially. No crime. You never have to lock your doors. No more bills, no more bars. You are on a permanent vacation for the rest of your life with zero worries. In the presence of Jesus Christ, in his love, and thanking him for what he has done for you. All right, you can open your eyes. I'm sorry, but you're back to the reality. That is going to be the reward. In the presence of Jesus, I want to be there more than any other place in this world. So I got to take this one step further. I'm almost done. When we go into judgment, there's always a standard by which people are judged by, right? If you go into today's courtroom, judges and lawyers always quote from the books of the law, page so-and-so, article so-and-so, and section so-and-so, and they state, thou shall not exceed 40 kilometers in a school zone. Whether I've obeyed the law or disobeyed it divide, decides whether I'm guilty or I'm not, Right? The same thing in heaven. There is a standard by which we are all judged. Do you want to see what it is? All right, go to the book of James. The book of James is near the end of your Bible. It's in the New Testament as well. Go into the book of James. Some believe that the, James was the brother of Jesus uh, who wrote that book. We're not sure, but some people believe that. And we know that James really uh, got on fire and got involved in the church. So James chapter 2. Go to James chapter 2. And uh, we'll go to verses 10 to 12. And I'm sorry, I told you to go there, but I have it on the screen. But nonetheless, sometimes you may have a different version, and it's neat. I use the New King James Version, but some people may have others. It says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. I'm going to stop right here. James is quoting something here. Anybody know what he's quoting? 
Do not commit adultery and do not murder. Anybody know? Yeah, I can hear you say it almost from your home here. It's the Ten Commandments. It says, now if you do not commit adultery, but you murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Again, I believe this is talking about the Ten Commandments. James is quoting the Old Testament commandment in the New Testament, showing us that this is the law by which we will be judged. As a society, I believe that we're getting more and more comfortable to lay aside God's precepts or God's Ten Commandments. And even in churches, many, I was listening to a sermon this week um, from a church. Um, an evangelical church where the man specifically made some statements that I'm afraid, I'm afraid he's going to pay for it because he's leading other people astray. People say that we live under grace and that the commandments have been nailed at the cross. We're no longer under that covenant. We have a new covenant. We're going to talk about that next week. The concept of covenant has been totally misunderstood by the Christian church. And I hope next week that we'll get a better understanding. I love God's law with all my heart. It's a law of liberty. That's what it calls it. See, that's the problem. We consider laws to be constricting. And I think that for the most part, even the laws that the government put us under, they're there for our good. They're there to protect us in most cases. But in in God's case, All of them, they're there to protect us. All ten of them. Just like any good law, it provides liberty. But our sinful nature often translates laws into taking away our freedom. Our freedom to what? To hurt ourselves? To hurt others? Is that freedom, really? I consider that to be more binding, bonding than than freedom. Look at what our world has become. And it's become like this because I believe that human free will is now overriding the commandments of God. Let's go to Ecclesiastes. It's in the Old Testament. It's written by a man by the name of Solomon. And he wrote these words. An incredibly wise man. And he closes his book in chapter 12 with these words. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14, and says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. He says, okay, I've written 12 chapters here. Here's what it all boils down to. Fear God, means give him glory, trust him, respect him for who he is, and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil evil I don't know how clear how more clear this can be you may fool people here on earth but no one will fool God this is serious serious Jesus even taught it in Matthew chapter 12 it says but I say to you that every idle word man may speak they will give account of it in a day of judgment for by your words you will be justified or by your words you will be condemned Folks, words are spoken from the heart. They will either condemn or justify us. This is incredibly serious. And you're probably, your heart is probably aching at this time and saying, Francis, how, how am I going to be saved? This is talking about me. I don't always say the right words. So I want to assure you today that you have nothing to worry about as God is on your side. Look at this verse in Hebrews chapter 7. And get familiar with where the book of Hebrews is because we're going to spend a lot of time in it next week. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. One of the most beautiful and promising and hopeful verses in the Bible. Therefore he, God, is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Jesus, through him. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. So this in for a minute. According to this verse, being lost is one of the most difficult things to do. 
the worst sinner listening to this sermon this morning can be saved to the uttermost. He says in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. John six thirty seven. And the one that comes to me, I will by no means cast out. God wants you. He wants you to know who he truly is. Perhaps he's the father you never knew. He says, if we confess our sins in 1 John 1, 9, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How many righteous unrighteousness? All, everything. There's nothing he can't forgive, nothing that will push you from his love, nothing that will push him away except for you. I hope today you understand now that you don't have to fear the judgment unless you decide to face it without an attorney, without Jesus Christ. And that's your decision. When I look at myself, I don't see how I could ever be saved. <laughs> but when I look at Jesus, I don't see how I could ever be lost. When a devil comes knocking at your door and tries to bring up your past, tries to make you feel guilty and a terrible sinner, when he reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. It's going to be hot where he's going. Jude one twenty two says, Now to him was able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Check this out. This is a heavenly scene. You show up and Jesus is standing there and God is here. And you show up and Jesus goes, yeah, yeah, he's mine. Go ahead, let him go. No, no, no. Exceedingly joy. Hey, Francis, I'm so glad you made it. I'm so glad you accepted me. Hey, God, this is my buddy Francis. And he's going to heaven. He's going to spend eternity with us. Can, and then we all do a group hug. That's how Jesus is. That's how God is. That's what he wants to do with you and me. This, he's going to present you faultless as if you have never done anything wrong. Get that in your thick skull. Jesus is there to cover you and God is there to accept that Jesus says so. You can't lose unless you decide to present yourself without your attorney. Folks, soon this judgment is going to be over and the books are going to be closed. I don't want any of you to not have the assurance of your salvation. That's what I live for. I would have taken any other job in the world. But no, I accepted this call because I want people to know the Jesus that loves me and loves them. And I will do it till my dying breath. Make Jesus your attorney. By accepting him in your life, don't hesitate anymore. What's the use? It's time for you to just say, God, I don't know you. I don't understand all this stuff, but I'm moved. I'm moved to put you in my life. I don't know how. You know what, folks? When, whenever COVID is over, I don't care if you have to travel an hour and a half. Come and see us here at Really Living. We love to worship God. We love to fellowship with one another. We love to serve our community. And you'll grow with us. You're going to help us grow and we're going to help you grow. But it's time for you to stop hesitating. It's time for you to just give it all to him. It's time for you to make Jesus your attorney. What do you have to lose? The reward far outweighs anything this earth could ever offer. Give your life to Jesus right now and let him take you on a journey of your life. Next week, we're going to cover the longest prophecy in the Bible and the most precise that I've ever seen entitled, The Final Cleansing. It is the most beautiful message that the Bible has ever given us. I hope you'll join us. Father in heaven, Man, I am so, so unworthy to be up here, so unworthy to be sharing these words from, 
But you have such a love for us, for each human being. You've set up the judgment throne so no, no one has to walk in there afraid. Jesus, thank you for being willing to die on a cross for us. And God, thank you for being willing to give your son. We no longer fear the judgment. We understand now that there's a bigger theater. We understand that you had to let sin play itself out so that every human being, every being, will never let it enter this universe again. And so, Lord, we know sin has the best of us most of the time, but today, we ask and we make this promise that we are going to watch and pray. We are going to watch and pray like we never have done before so that you can straighten out our lives and that we can live fully loved and fully forgiven. Thank you for this message today. It has changed my heart and I hope that it has changed yours. Amen.